This is the second lecture from Chapter 17, and this lecture will focus on acid-based titrations. It is a super long, in-depth lecture, so I'll tell you right now, I recommend you break it up into a couple of sittings. The purpose of a titration is to determine the concentration of some solution whose concentration is not known. And uh, that concentration of the stuff you're analyzing is called, or that substance is called the analyte. And how you do the titration is you fill the burette full of a known substance with a very um, precisely determined concentration. And that substance, the known substance, is called the titrant. And you deliver that substance through the burette. It is set to react with the analyte. And through stoichiometry then, you can determine the concentration of the unknown. So with just a bit more detail, and if you haven't already done a titration in lab, you will, um, but typically you measure out a known volume of the analyte, put it into typically an Erlenmeyer flask, just because these flasks are really easy to swirl around without spilling or splashing anything. And you also add to the an analyte the unknown concentration, um, a color indicator so that you know when the chemical reaction is done. And then you fill the burette with a known substance called the titrant, and um, you start delivering it dropwise until you see a color change. Um, this has phenolphthalein in it, which turns pink when the solution is basic and is colorless when the solution is acidic. So when the um, solution does change colors, that's called the end point of the titration. And you will learn on the next slide, there's another vocabulary word called equivalence point. And although those are very close to one another, they're not identically, they're not equivalent to one another. So as I said, the end point is when the color actually changes. The equivalence point is the stoichiomet stoichiometric end of the reaction between the known and unknown. So... Um, one of my three dogs is here dying to play ball and wanting to bark. Um, so anyway, the equivalence is a stoichiometric end to the chemical reaction between the known and unknown. So the, uh, the idea is to select a color indicator who, that changes colors as close as possible to the actual stoichiometric equivalence point. So the equivalence point and end point are very close to one another but not always exactly the same. Some of the indicators um, that are commonly used, I've shown here. And phenolphthalein, I believe, is the one that you use in your lab. It undergoes a chemical change just when it becomes slightly basic. Um, and so if you're trying to figure out when you have neutralized something, um, phenolphthalein is a good one to use um, because shortly after you pass a neutral point, you're going to see a color change. Litmus paper, obviously. Well, litmus paper is actually just paper that's been impregnated with a color in indicator. And the color indicator used, litmus, um, changes exactly at the neutral point. So red or pink for acidic solutions and blue for basic solutions. One of the more common calculations you will be asked to do concerning a titration is to determine, whoops, to determine when, at what point, the equivalence point will occur. And just so that you totally understand what we mean by that from a mathematical point of view, Let's say that you had, um, let's see, 50 milliliters of a 0.2 molar 
solution of nitric acid that we're going to call the analyte. That's the material that's in the Erlenmeyer flask that you're titrating. And you're titrating with the titrate sodium hydroxide. So that would be the one in your burette. Um, and so when would you reach the equivalence point? So that would be when the moles of sodium hydroxide titrate that have been added exactly equal the original moles of the analyte you started with. So just as a reminder, how do you get to moles? You multiply volume times molarity, and that gives you moles. Now, when in titrations, you've, you may have already noticed that a lot of times we talk about millimoles instead of moles. And how you get millimoles is instead of converting milliliters to liters, you leave it as milliliters. And then when you multiply it by molarity, which of course is moles per liter, it doesn't completely cancel the liter part of it. Think of that as canceling. And what you end up with then is 10 millimoles. Now, if you're more comfortable working with liters, that's perfectly fine. It's just more work. So if you wanted to convert 50 milliliters to liters, it would be 0 0.0500 liters times 0.2 moles per liter. And then, of course, your units would be moles instead of millimoles. That would be 0 0.0100 moles. So you would always still get the same answer. But the equivalence point would be reached when the original amount of analyte that was in the Erlenmeyer flask um, was exactly equal to the amount of titrin that you've added. Often chemists will generate what we call a titration curve as they're doing a titration. So a titration curve, and you need to be able to interpret these and in some cases actually create them yourself, but it is a plot of pH versus milliliters of titrin added, um, and pH is on the y-axis. So let's say that you are titrating an acid, in this case hydrochloric acid, with a base, sodium hydroxide, and so the first point is always zero amount of titrin added, no sodium hydroxide added. So in other words, the titration hasn't started. And you're just asking, what is the pH of the HCl that you're getting ready to titrate? That's always the first point. Then you'll notice the titration curve in general. The pH increases gently at first. As you add base, you would expect the pH to increase. Then there's a very sharp jump. So the midpoint of that sharp jump is considered the equivalence point. Okay. And so you, you basically just measure literally halfway of that um, big vertical jump to find the equivalence point. And then if you shoot past the equivalence point, which is a good idea to do just to make sure you really have reached the equivalence point, you'll see the uh, pH gradually increase again. Now just so that you have seen titration of a base, and I know we don't tend to talk about bases as much as acids, but obviously if you're titrating a base, it's an original initial pH is going to be high, greater than 7. <clears throat> and so again, now we're talking about the base being our analyte, what's in the Erlenmeyer flask, and the acid being in the burette. So it's kind of reverse of what we talked about before. So the pH is going to start high, and then as you add the acid, um, the pH will drop, and again, the equivalence point is going to be a really steep drop, and the halfway point of the drop is the equivalence point. An acid-base titration is literally a neutralization reaction. You're using the fact that acids and bases react in a stoichiometric fashion um, to quantify the concentration of some unknown solution. So as we get into further calculations with titrations, you're going to need to be able to write a neutralization reaction. So here's a real simple one. 
This problem says you have hydrochloric acid um, that's being titrated with sodium hydroxide. So this is the reaction. These are the reactants. And is when you react a strong acid and strong base, your products are water and salt. Um, just to kind of remind you, bring you back to last semester, uh, an acid-base reaction is actually a double replacement reaction. And so if you think of each of the two reactants as an ionic compound, um, break them into the cation and the anion, the cation and the anion, um, the two outer ions end up together, so sodium and chloride end up together, and the two inner ions end up together to make water. So that is a double replacement reaction, and you, should, you need to be able to draw a neutralization reaction. So this particular problem is treating hydrochloric acid as the analyte, the thing that's in the Erlenmeyer flask, and asking you to determine the concentration of that analyte, assuming that what's in the burette, your titrant, is a known concentration of sodium hydroxide. And this is telling you that exactly 30 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide needed to be added in order to reach the equivalence point. So based on that information, they're asking you, what is the concentration of that HCl on the flask? I'm going to show you two ways to, to calculate the equivalence point. One way is unit cancellation, and the second way is kind of a shortcut method. So the unit cancellation method, which is probably the best way of showing your work, is you always want to start out by calculating the moles of the titrant added from the burette. And this is probably the most important formula to remember in this chapter. How do you get moles during um, it, when you have solutions? It's molarity times volume, okay? Um, and then once you have the moles of the titrant, which in this problem is the known substance, which is sodium hydroxide, you can use the um, stoichioma stoichiometry of the balanced equation, which happens to be a 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 coefficients. Um, use the mole ratio, which is 1 to 1, to calculate the moles of the analyte, which in this problem, that's what you're analyzing, that's HCl. Um, so, okay, once you have moles of analyte, um, you'll want to have concentration, the ultimate information you're trying to find is the concentration of the analyte. So how do you get concentration? Remember the units? It's moles per liter. You just calculated moles. So you take the moles that you calculated here and you divide it by the liters of um, the HCl that you were analyzing. So in this case, how much HCl did we analyze? Let me Oh, that was kind of weird. That's really weird. I didn't know I could do that. Hmm, okay. <laughs> um, let's see. So we, wow, we started with 50 milliliters of HCl. So you would take the moles of the HCl you just calculated and divide it by 50 milliliters or 0 0.050 liters. All right, so one more thing before we start doing sample calculations. Um, I just want to go over millimole again because we, you haven't worked with it in the past much because it's a lot more convenient, and even if you decide not to use it, you're going to see it used a lot. So first of all, what is a millimole? Okay, um, A millimole is one, whoopee daisy, one one thousandths of a mole, okay? Another way of saying that is 1,000 millimoles equals one mole. All right, so how do you get millimoles? I mentioned it before, I'm gonna mention it one more time. So if you have milliliters and you multiply that by molarity, you're going to get millimoles, okay? If you have liters and you multiply it by molarity, you're going to get moles.
All right, so going through the particular problem that I just kind of sketched out the process for, again, remember step one is calculate the moles of titrant. Again, it's always volume times molarity. Volume times concentration will give you moles or millimoles. Then we saw the reaction written out, and the stoichiometry was 1HCl reacts with 1NaOH. Okay, so mole ratio 1 to 1, so that gives you the moles of HCl. And because you ultimately want the concentration of HCl, not just moles, you take the moles of HCl and divide it by the volume of HCl that you analyzed, and that will give you the concentration of the analyte, the unknown. So that's a unit cancellation stoichiometric method. I'm going to go ahead and show you a shortcut way for getting the endpoint. It's only for getting or equivalence points, only for getting the equivalence point. And that is by using this handy dandy formula. Now, some people, some professors don't like you to use that formula because not everyone understands it, but it is a nice shortcut when you're taking a quiz or a test. So here's just the problem restated. And rather than going through that lengthy process we just went through, you could plug the information into this equation. This looks very similar to the dilution formula, if you remember that, M1V1 equals M2V2, except what's different when you're calculating the equivalence point for a titration, there are these little A and B. So what are those? Okay, so M sub A is molarity of the acid, V sub A is volume of the acid, molarity of the base, volume of the base. Now, little a is the number of hydrogen, acidic hydrogen ions in one molecule of acid. So look at HCl. How many acidic hydrogen ions are there? HCl just has one, so little a would be one for HCl. If you had H2SO4, that has two acidic hydrogen, so if we were dealing with that, A would equal 2. All right, so plugging the values we know into there, we just said that there's one hydrogen ion per molecule. We're trying to solve for the molarity of the acid, and we know that we started with 50 milliliters of the acid. Um, B represents the number of hydroxides in the base. There's only one hydroxide in a base molecule, so that's where this is. The molarity of the known base was 0.10, and we used 30 milliliters of the base to reach the equivalence point in the titration. When you simplify this, you get that the molarity of the acid is 0.060 molar, which is the exact same answer we got doing it the kind of longer unit cancellation stoichiometric method in the previous slides. So just so that you're aware of both methods, whichever you are more comfortable using. All right, so here's an example, one more example I'm going to go through with you before I kind of ask you, challenge you to do it on your own. This is um, the, where the analyte is a base instead of an acid. Okay, so this base would go in the Erlenmeyer flask. Notice that there are two hydroxides for every one molecule base. So that's going to affect your stoichiometry. <clears throat> the titrant in this case is a known concentration of HCl. So that would go into the burette. So as always, you're trying to find the concentration of the analyte. Um, so you want to start out, like if I were being nice <clears throat> and trying to help you, in a simple multiple choice question, I would probably give you this balanced equation. But notice, in order to balance this equation, here's your acid and your base. Your products, as always, are water and the salt. Now, this is a little bit more demanding because when you make a salt, which is an ionic compound, you've got to crisscross your charges. So if you look at the periodic table, Strontium is in group 2A, so when it becomes an ion, it has a charge of plus 2. Chloride is a halogen, and as an ion is minus 1. So when you crisscross those charges to get the correct formula of the salt, the ionic compound, 
it's SrCl2. So when you go to balance this overall reaction, it's not one to one to one to one anymore, okay? That's going to affect your calculations. So you need to know how to do this. All right, so here we go. We will go ahead and work this out both ways again. <clears throat> Using the stoichiometric way, so the first step, you always start with a known substance, okay, your standard, your titrant, and so you take the volume and you multiply it by the molarity, okay. I work in millimoles, so I keep the volume in milliliters, so that is the moles of HCl, the titrant. And then I use mole ratio. Um, the moles of H plus um, added have to equal the original moles of OH in the analyte, okay? <clears throat> so if we had 1.25 millimoles of HCl, according to this balanced equation, for every 2 HCl that react, we only need one strontium hydroxide. And so when we do that calculation, the moles of strontium hydroxide are 0.625. Then to get concentration, of course, we divide by the volume of strontium hydroxide we titrated, which is 20 mils. <clears throat> okay, shortcut way, I'm using this equation. The only thing you have to be careful of here is that the little b value for strontium hydroxide is two, okay? Because there are two hydroxides for every one molecule. So again, when you simplify that, you get the same information that the analyte base has a concentration of 0.03. All right, so this is kind of a comprehensive question. What if you were asked to generate a titration curve and so that's pH versus milliliter of titrant added. And you were asked to calculate the pH at various points so that you could draw a curve. How would you calculate these various points? How would you go about doing that? Um, well, it depends where you are in the curve. So it, we break it into regions. So, and this may not make a lot of sense at this point, but I would jot these regions down and how you do the calculation, and hopefully it'll make sense as we practice them. So if you are before the equivalence point on a pH curve, so that's right here before the steep jump, um, we use what we call a mole table. So we used mole tables in disturbing a buffer. Um, and so it's very, very similar. It's just stoichiometry. If you need to calculate the pH at the equivalence point, you use what we just went through. You use, um, could use the shortcut equation, or you could use the step-by-step -step method. But that's how you calculate at the equivalence point. After the equivalence point, you have totally neutralized the original acid and base. You've, you've reacted them completely with each other. And all you have after the equivalence point is you have some salt, which is innocuous if it's a strong acid and strong base, doesn't affect anything, and you have water. Okay, So if you go past that equivalence point, you're just dropping the titrant in all by itself. So you're just basically adding, if hydroxide is your titrant, you're just dumping extra hydroxide in. And so all you do in that case is minus log of hydronium concentration to find pH. So again, let, let's go through these examples. It'll make a bit more sense. The first thing you want to do in any titration problem is figure out where you are. Are you before the equivalence point? Are you at the equivalence point? Are you after it? Okay. And the only way to figure that out is to start out by calculating moles. So the first thing you always want to do, even if you have no clue what to do after that, calculate moles. Okay. 
and you do that always, it's molarity times volume, okay? So just make sure you get the things that belong together. So here's your volume, here's your molarity. That tells us we have two and a half millimoles of HCl. Here's our volume and molarity of the base, and we have five millimoles of KOH. Here is a mole table. You set it up just like an ice table, so you need to be able to write out the acid-base reaction that's occurring. Remember, the products of a strong acid, strong base reaction are a salt and water. Make sure it's balanced. The only, reason, the only time you'll have to use a coefficient of other than one is if either the acid or the base has like two hydroxides or two hydrogens. Other than that, you won't need to. It'll always be one to one to one to one. All right, so um, we have our, in a mold table, instead of calling it ice, they call it before, change, and after. So, yeah, I wrote them in the wrong place. Hold on. So these, this is the before up here. Change, after. All right, so we just calculated that we started with five millimoles of KOH, two and a half millimoles of HCl. However much you have of each, they're gonna react, okay? So the maximum amount of each that can react is determined by the limiting reactant, what there's the least of. So that's two and a half moles of hydrochloric acid. So obviously you're gonna end up with no hydrochloric acid, it's the limiting reactant and two and a half millimoles of it are gonna be used to react with the base. So you're gonna be left with two and a half millimoles of KOH unreacted. Okay. Um, and you're going to be making two and a half millimoles of KCl, which at this point, when we get to weak acids and bases, this'll matter. Right now it doesn't. And so, what is the pH? Well, as soon as you know the concentration of the excess um, component, you can find it. In this case, since your excess component is a base, you're going to first get pOH, which is minus log of the concentration. Now, listen very, very carefully. Since you're you're dealing with a mole table for stoichiometry and pOH and pH are determined with concentration, not moles. So you need to take the mole value from the mole table and divide by the total volume that it's in. Now what gets tricky about titrations is the volume changes. As you add more and more titrant to the analyte, you're gonna get more and more volume. So you have to be really careful. So what is the total volume of solution that we have at this point? Well, we have 25 milliliters of HCl solution plus 50 milliliters of KOH solution that we've mixed all together. So our total volume is 75 milliliters. So that is used, you need the concentration. Um, so that tells us that pOH is 1.48. We want pH, okay? So, of course, that's 14 minus whatever pOH is. And here is our pH at this point. We are not at the equivalence point. How do you know? How do you know that we're not at the equivalence point? Well, because we haven't neutralized, completely neutralized. We've only halfway neutralized. So the equivalence point would be when both of the original reactants are zero. So to summarize what we just did, if you were titrating a strong acid and strong base, um, the first thing you do is find millimoles or moles of each of them. Determine which one has used up. Sometimes if they're both used up, then it's the, you're at the equivalence point. Um, set up a mole table and figure out what you have access of, and the excess acid or base is going to be the one that determines the pH. So if you have acid left over, um, you're gonna find the concentration of acid and you can find pH directly. 
If the base is the one that's left over, as in the problem we just did, you first have to find pOH and then pH. If you end up with zero of both of them, if you had equal amounts of each um, and they're both gone, you're going to have zero concentration. Well, not zero, but nothing in excess, and the pH will be neutral, seven. Okie doke. So titration of a strong acid with a strong base is quite easy compared to what we're getting ready to start. So make sure before you start listening to this part that you're fresh, that you're attentive. And the rest of this now is going to be titrating a weak acid or a weak base. So let me just kind of emphasize the equivalence point um, for a strong acid and strong base, which is what we've been talking about up to now, the equivalence point is always 7, neutral for a strong acid and a strong base. Look at this particular titration graph. And remember how I said to find equivalence point. You, you measure this steep increase in pH, measure at the halfway point, go over and see what the pH is, Notice for this particular substance, the equivalence point is almost 9. Okay, so it's not neutral. How on earth does that happen? Well, I'm here to tell you, first of all, that if the equivalence point is not 7, you're dealing with a weak acid or a weak base. I'll repeat this a couple times, but if the pH at the equivalence point is greater than 7, you are titrating a weak acid. Okay. If the pH at the equivalence point is less than 7, you're titrating a weak base. That will make more sense later. How on earth does that happen? Well, remember a generic neutralization reaction. When you react an acid with a base, you get water and a salt, which is the nickname for an ionic compound. Okay. Now, if you're titrating a strong acid and a strong base, the salt is going to be harmless. You're going to end up with things like NaCl, uh, barium, um, iodide. I'm just trying to think of it. Um, so if the salt comes from a strong acid, strong base, it, they're, they're neutral. So this is where you have to understand the end of chapter 16 when we talked about pH of salts. And what we learned there is that if a salt comes from a strong acid and strong base, it does not affect pH. However, if the salt comes from a weak acid or a weak base, it does change pH. So if you're titrating a weak acid or a weak base, your equivalence point is going to be not neutral because of this salt. So here in chart form is what I just said. Okay, Again, strong acid, strong base, titration, the equivalence point is exactly neutral. If you're titrating a weak acid, equivalence point is greater than 7. If you're titrating a weak base, the equivalence point is less than 7. Commit that to memory. So look at the titration curve for a weak acid. So again, it's always pH versus milliliters of the titrant. If you have a strong acid here, let's, that's the one on the bottom. So what are different? How is titration curve for strong acid different than those for a weak acid? Well, first of all, the initial pH is likely to be lower. It's more acidic to begin with. It's a strong acid. And the equivalence point, remember, of a strong acid is exactly equal to 7. And then as your acid gets weaker and weaker, now remember, as K gets smaller or more negative exponent, it's a weaker and weaker acid. So as the acid gets weaker, the initial pH is higher, and the equivalence point is higher. Alrighty, so calcul calculations for pH during a titration are quite complex and require a lot of practice.
Um, a lot of former students will tell you that titration calculations were the most difficult they did in 1212, just because there are so many variations of them. So again, let's say that we were titrating a weak acid with a strong base. The first part of calculation for any titration, whether it be strong acid, strong base, or weak acid, weak base, is stoichiometry. So you always start by calculating how many moles you have of everything and setting up a mole table. In the case of a weak acid or weak base, however, um, you then have to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation to find the pH. Because, as you'll see in a bit, as you start to titrate a weak acid or weak base, you actually generate a buffer. And so you must use Henderson-Hasselbalch to calculate pH rather than just minus log. So let me explain how, when you start a titration on weak acid or weak base, you generate a buffer. So let's say we have a weak acid and that we're titrating with, it with a strong base. As we titrate it, as we react those two, remember that the acid donates a hydrogen ion to the base. And so you're going to end up with the conjugate base and water. Now look what you've done. You now have, until you reach the end point, you now have a weak acid and its conjugate base. That by definition, when you have both of those present, is a buffer. So that means at the end you need to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. But the mole table is set up the same way. So let's look at this problem. It says, of course, it'll always have to give you Ka to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, but you have 10 milliliters of a 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide solution. So you know right away you can multiply those by each other to get the millimoles of sodium hydroxide. That's before, change, and after. I don't really care what you call these rows, <laughs> but um, first, middle, and after. So you know the moles there. And um, again, moles of the weak acid, which we're just calling HA, 50 milliliters times 0.1, so you have 5 millimoles. So since your base is strong, 100% of it's going to react. So the reaction itself is not an equilibrium. It's all going to react. So whatever your um, titrant is, is going to be subtracted from the initial amounts. Of course, you start out with no none of the conjugate base before the reaction. So you're going to decrease your initial analyte by however much titrant you've added. So your new or after amount of the original weak acid is 4 millimoles. Of course, all the hydroxide has been reacted. And you have generated 1 millimole of the conjugate base. So now that you have the, the base, the conjugate acid and base concentrations, use Henderson-Hasselbalch equation to find pH. Make sure that the um, base goes on top and that the acid goes on bottom. Remember in the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, um, you can use moles or millimoles here, it doesn't have to be concentration because units cancel. So now the, the pH at this point in the titration is 2.54. We have not reached the equivalence point. Equivalence point would be, um, both of these would be zero at the equivalence point. So I want to step back for a minute and I want to look at the different regions of titrating a weak acid or a weak base, just kind of like we did with a strong one. So the initial, the initial pH is going to be the pH before you've added any titrant, okay? So here's our titration reaction. So before you've added any titrant, any hydroxide at all,
What is the pH? How do you find the pH of a weak acid? Well, let me remind you, to find the pH of a weak acid, you simply set up an ice table. Okay? You set up an ice table, you use the equilibrium constant, and you solve for X, or the concentration of hydronium ion. So, the first point in a titration curve for a weak acid or weak base would be, is basically an ice table calculation. Then as soon as you start adding the titrant, the hydroxide, you create the buffer, remember? Because you have both, until you reach the equivalence point, you have both the original weak acid and you are now generating its conjugate base. So this whole region before the equivalence point is what we call the buffer region, and in that region, you must use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. All right, at the equivalence point, these are really tricky, and I'll be doing some examples for you, but at the equivalence point, the um, original acid, weak acid and base are totally gone, and all you have at the equivalence point is the conjugate base, okay, the product, which in this case is A minus. That's all you have at the equivalence point. So, and the reason that the equivalence point is not 7 is because the conjugate base of a weak acid can go on to react with water to change the pH. And a, a conjugate base is going to produce hydroxide, and therefore it's going to make the solution basic. So when you're all done titrating a weak acid and all you have left of its conjugate base, the pH is going to be basic. Okay, it's going to be between 8 and 9 typically. All right, um, so at this point, um, at the equivalence point, you need Kb because the conjugate base is a base. So these get really complex. Don't freak out yet, but you may want to... I would write these down or print out this page or something to use as reference. If you have passed the equivalence point, so if you're up here in region 4, um, all you have to do is calculate how much excess titrant you've added. Um, so it's just simple minus log of the OH concentration. So there are four different calculations you do for titration of a weak acid or base. All right, here we go with some examples. You have to know your strong acids and bases. Even if you don't, if you're given a Ka or Kb value, it's a big red flag that it's titration of a weak acid or weak base. All right, so the first thing you do always, 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 even if you don't know what you're doing, is calculate moles of everything you can, okay? So, um, before the titration, okay, before we have added any sodium hydroxide at all, in fact, all that's present is the original weak acid. Now we're going back to chapter 15. When we did weak acids and weak bases, okay? Mm, no, yeah, it is chapter 15. Um, and so we just set up an ice table, okay? Acetic acid um, is in equilibrium in water with its conjugate base. The original concentration of acetic acid is whatever they told you. Um, use our typical X's, um, plug the equilibrium concentrations of each of them into the expression for K. So Ka would be X squared over 0 0.10 minus X. Can we neglect X? Yes, because the exponent in Ka is minus 4 or more negative. So we would make a little note we can neglect because Ka is small. Then we solve for X. X equals concentration hydronium ion. 
and uh, so take the minus log of that. That gives our initial pH before we add any base of 2.87. So on the next slide, we're going to start adding the titrate. Okay, so as soon as you add one drop of the NaOH, the titrant, you begin to generate a buffer. You're making some of the conjugate base, and that's when you have to do a mole table and then Henderson-Hasselbalch. So, for example, let's say we add 10 milliliters of the titrant. Again, first step is always moles of everything. It'll get your partial credit even if you don't know what to do after that. All right, so here is our mole table. Before, change, and after. Um, so at this point, you need to write the reaction that's going on during the titration. Acetic acid, hydroxide, makes the acid ion. Remember, hydroxide is just going to snatch the acidic hydrogen off the acid. So you're going to get water in the conjugate base. Um, all right, your before mole values that you're going to calculate. Um, sodium hydroxide is 10 milliliters times 0.1 molar, um, which is 1 millimole. We already calculated on the last slide that we have 5 millimoles of acetic acid. Of course, we start out with zero of the conjugate base. Whatever you get for the moles of the titrant um, goes in your change row. You're going to subtract from the reactant side, so we're down to 4 millimoles of acetic acid. All of the hydroxide's gone, and we've generated 1 millimole of the acetate, the conjugate base. So now that you have the conjugate base and weak acid, you can now plug into henderson hassel Okay, so pKa. Make sure you put the base amount on top. Again, it can be in moles. doesn't have to be concentration for henderson hasselbach So the pH at this point is 4.14. So if we were to start making a titration curve, okay, our initial pH was, uh, let's see, one, two, three, was about 2.87, and that's when we have zero hydroxide added. And then, let's see, when we added 10 milliliters of hydroxide, the pH went up to 4.14. Such a good artist. Okay, so, so far we have a titration curve that looks like that. Alrighty, let's skip ahead to the equivalence point. What is the pH at the equivalence point? So look again at the reaction for um, titrating a weak acid. All right. So at the equivalence point, all of the reactants are gone. They've neutralized each other. And the only substance you have present at the equivalence point is the conjugate base, is the product. Okay. So all you need to worry about at the equivalence point is what is this conjugate base going to do? It's the only thing that's capable at this point of affecting the pH. So now you show the reaction that occurs with that conjugate base. Okay, so remember, what does a base do? It abstracts a proton. So you're going to end up forming hydroxide is the important part. So now... At the equivalence point, you have you have to set up an ice table for a this time a weak base. Remember before the titration began, you set up an ice table for a weak acid. When it's all done, all you have left is a base. So now you have to set up an ice table for a weak base. So here's an actual example. And it's pretty obvious you've reached the equivalence point here. It's obvious that we have equal amounts of the titrant and the analyte, so they've obliterated each other. It won't always be that obvious. And so all we have left in this specific problem, we were working with acetic acid, 
So all we have left at the equivalence point is the acetate ion, the conjugate base. And here is the equilibrium the conjugate base is going to establish with water. And so now you simply set up your ice table using this reaction. Before I go to the ice table, I want to point out um, millimoles here. How many millimoles or moles of this do you have? You have the same number of moles of your product as you did of the original reactant. So your original reactant was acetic acid, and you had 50 milliliters times 0.10 mole per liter, or you had 5 millimoles of acetic acid to begin with. At the equivalence point, that all of those moles have now been um, converted to the conjugate base. So when we go to the ice table, the original moles of the acetate ion are going to be the same as they were originally for the starting material, 5 millimoles. Alrighty, so whether you want to write 5 millimoles, which is the same thing as 0 0.005 moles, okay, there you go. Now, ice tables, remember the only thing different from the mole table is ice table must be in concentrations. So you have the moles or millimoles of the product conjugate base, but you have to divide that by the volume that it's in at this point. Now remember, during a titration, your volume is constantly increasing because you're adding stuff from the burette. So what total volume do you have at the equivalence point? If you go back to the question, you'll see you had 50 milliliters of the original weak acid and you titrated with 50 milliliters. So you have a total of 100 milliliters, um, or 0.1 liter, and so this whole thing is your concentration of the conjugate base to begin with. It establishes equilibrium in water, so just your normal ice table, minus x plus x. You can neglect x because, um, oh, I forgot to mention that. What k value? Well, I did kind of allude to it a few slides ago. But at the end, at the equivalence point, since s is a base, you need kb, okay? And the problem typically gives you ka. So ka for acetic acid was 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. So at the equivalence point, you have to do, you have to calculate kb. So remember that's 1 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by whatever Ka is. Alrighty, so that means that Kb is 5.55 times 10 to the minus 10. Yay, it's really small, which means it's perfectly fine to neglect this x we had from the ice table. I'll say neglect because Kb is small. So remember now, if you're dealing with a base <clears throat> like we are here, that the X you saw for is going to be hydroxide concentration. So the first thing you'll get is pOH, then 14 minus pOH will give you pH. Whoa. So at the equivalence point, the pH is 8.72. So going back to our titration curve, okay, we're going something like this, okay. So our equivalence point would be 8.72. Okie doke, here's where I want you to muddle around yourself a bit. So we have the titration of a weak acid, formic acid, and with a strong base. And I want you to try to calculate the pH of this titration at four different points. I want you to calculate it when no hydroxide has been added, okay, when all you have is the formic acid. Then after 10 milliliters, 20 milliliters, and 30 milliliters, 
of sodium hydroxide have been added. So at each of these, that's four calculations or four problems. At each of those amounts, the very first thing you do is calculate moles and set up a mole table. From the mole table, you should be able to tell where you are at in the titration curve. You should be able to tell whether you're in the buffer region or at the equivalence point or after. But not until you set up that mole table are you typically going to know where you're at on the titration curve and therefore what your second calculation will be. I'm helping you out at this point. Here is the titration reaction, okay, formic acid, okay, and so this is the structure for your mole table, where it's going to be the before moles, the change in moles, and the after moles. So see if you can go ahead and do that for each one of these and figure out where you are in the titration. I would recommend turning the video off and seeing what you can do on your own, and then I'll go through the answers on the next slide. Alrighty, any time you have a weak acid or weak base and you have not started the titration, you haven't added any of the base yet, that means it's simply a weak acid ice table problem. That's all you have present is the weak acid in water. Okay, so that's just your ice table with your the original moles, excuse me, the original concentration. You don't even have need to use moles here because you don't need a mole table because you have no stoichiometry going on. Um, so the original concentration of the weak acid, use X or Y or whatever, and then plug into your Ka expression. So in this case, Y squared over 0.5 minus Y. Can we neglect X? Well, yes, we can just barely neglect it because it's 10 to the minus 4. All right, so now um, solving then for Y, which is going to be hydronium ion concentration, 9.5 times 10 to the minus 3. And now that we have hydronium concentration, you can find pH, which is just minus log of that. All right, so minus log of 9.5 times 10 to the minus 3 equals... Uh, so pH equals 2.02. .02. So that's the initial pH at 0 milliliters of hydroxide added. Okie doke. So now as soon as you start adding the titrant, the base, you've got to calculate moles of everything and set up a mole table. So, again, I like to work with millimoles. So just multiply the volume by the molarity of each substance. Once you get that, set up your mole table. You can already see that you're not at the equivalence point, I hope, right? You started with 10 millimoles of the original weak acid, and you've titrated half of it, right? You've only added enough hydroxide to neutralize half of it. So you're not yet at the equivalence point. You're at the halfway point. So here's your mole table. The initial moles of the weak acid and conjugate base, of course you have zero of the product to begin with. Whatever the concentration of titrin is, is what goes in your change row. So at the end, you've got five millimoles, if you hear breathing, it's my dogs, I'm sorry. You have five millimoles of the original weak acid left and you have generated five millimoles of its conjugate base. So now since you're in the buffer region, you haven't reached the equivalence point, so you're in the buffer region, you now plug in henderson hasselbalch Do you remember what's magical when you reach the halfway point and the base and acid quantities are equal to each other? That means that ratio is 1. Log of 1 is 0. So pH at the halfway point is just minus log of Ka. Okay, so we're 3.74. Right, the third problem, 20 milliliters of base added. So you have added 10 mil, millimoles of base. If you go back a slide or two, that's what we started with. We started with 10 millimoles of the original weak acid, formic acid. C-O-O-H. 
Anyway, we start with 10 millimoles. So now we're at the equivalence point. When the amount of titrant you've added equals the amount of weak acid you started with, that's the equivalent point, and all of the original um, reactants are gone. So here you go. So you have zero of the reactants left. You've ne they've neutralized each other, so those are gone. All you have left at the equivalence point is the conjugate base, and so that is now a weak base. So now we need to think about calculating Kb and setting up an ice table. There's no stoichiometry anymore. It's just an ice table with concentrations of the weak base. So in order to set up an ice table, you need concentrations. So that's moles divided by total volume. And so we know we have from our mole table that we have 10 millimoles of the conjugate base. Be careful with the volume because the volume that this is in now is the cumulative volume. And if you go back to the question, it said you started with 20 milliliters of formic acid. And at this point, you've added 20 milliliters of hydroxide. So your total volume is 40 milliliters. So the volume of the conjugate base at the end is 0 0.250 molar. So now we set up our ice table for this conjugate base. So remember how to write the equilibrium in water for a conjugate base. A base, remember, simply abstracts a proton from water. So you end up with hydroxide and the original weak acid. Just like any ice table, here's the initial concentration. We use X's or Y's or whatever. And so now, remember, you're working with KB because this is a base. So you plug in your values, and as always, it's going to be like X or Y squared in the top, 0 0.250 minus Y in the bottom. Can we neglect X, Y, whatever you're calling it? Yes, we can. KB is very small, so we're going to neglect that. Remember, when you're dealing with bases, that the X or what the unknown value is going to be concentration of hydroxide. So solving for concentration of hydroxide, we're going to get pOH, which is minus log of that. And then, of course, pH is 14 minus pOH. So pH is 8.57 at the equivalence point. Now remember, when you're titrating a weak acid, as we are now, and you reach the equivalence point, the pH is usually between 8 and 9. So if you get something like the equivalence point of 6 or 7, um, you likely did a calculation error. All right, the final one I want you to do. And this is going to be after the equivalence point. All right, so now, again, first thing you always do is find moles. You have now added 15 millimoles of hydroxide, which is too much. You only needed to have added 10 millimoles of the base to reach the equivalence point. So how much extra hydroxide have you added? If you set up your mole table, you can see you have neutralized all the weak acid, but all you have excess 5 millimoles of hydroxide. So it's very simple past the equivalence point. Just find the concentration of the excess hydroxide. You can ignore the conjugate base. It's not important compared to the hydroxide. Here's the concentration of hydroxide. Now we take minus log of it to give us pOH, and then 14 minus pOH gives us pH. A couple things I want to remind you of that are important to make a note of before you start working through tons and tons of problems, practice problems, is at the halfway point. Okay, we did a problem like that, but I want you to be acutely aware it'll save a lot of time, especially on a test. Then when you've reached the halfway point, pH equals pKa. So in case you still were not able to work independently on that last problem, I have one more that I'm not going to work through the mechanics for you, um, but I want you to force yourself if you didn't do the last one independently. And on the next slide, I simply have the answers. So you can try to work them or not work them, 
here are the pH values. And I'm going to mention just a few things about polyprotic acids, and then we're done with lecture. All right, so polyprotic acid is an acid that has more than one acidic hydrogen. So H2SO4, H3PO4 are polyprotic acids. H2SO4 is diprotic, H3PO4 is triprotic. Now, polyprotic acids lose their acidic hydrogens one at a time. For example, if you have H2SO4 and you put it in water, the first thing it's going to do is lose one proton to give you HO, HSO4 minus and H3O, hydronium ion. But then that HSO4, that conjugate base, can, because there's another acidic hydrogen still hanging there, it can react further with water to give SO4 2 minus and another H3O. So I want you to be able to write these sequential stepwise um, deprotonations. Now, with each deprotonation, with each ionization, there's a separate equilibrium value. So notice for a polyprotic acid, there'll be Ka1, Ka2. And Ka1, the first one, is always quite a bit larger than Ka2, loss of the second acidic hydrogen. All right. If you have a triprotic acid like phosphoric acid, Ka1 is quite a bit larger than Ka2, and that's quite a bit larger than Ka3. Um, the one other thing I want you to recognize, um, simply because I've seen it on the ACS final, is you if you have a titration curve, so if you see pH on the y-axis and milliliters of base added on the x-axis, and you see two humps, okay, each hump represents um, equivalence point. So in this case, we have one equivalence point, two equivalence points. For each hump, um, or multiple humps means polyprotic acid. So if you see two humps, it is a diprotic acid, like sulfuric, for example. If you see three humps or three equivalence points, it's a triprotic acid. So just be able to recognize that. Most of the time, when you're given... Um, a problem that has a polyprotic acid and you're asked to calculate pH, it's usually pretty easy. Usually you can treat it as a monoprotic acid. So just in case, you're not going to see it on my test. Well, you may see the, the two hump or three hump graph, but you're not going to see a calculate the pH problem, but you might on the final. So for example, if you had phosphoric acid and you were asked to calculate the pH of a certain concentration of it, what you could pretty safely do, first of all, phosphoric is not a strong acid, it's a weak acid. So you're gonna have an ice table and concentrations. But removing the first proton from phosphoric acid is so much more, su such a stronger acid than step two, okay? And step two would be taking the original conjugate base from the first step <clears throat> and giving up a second <clears throat> proton. Okay, so if you were gonna calculate the pH of these, obviously you need to find through an ice table, the concentration of hydronium ion. What can get really complicated with a polyprotic acid is you've got hydronium ion formed from the first step, but then that the product from that first step can go on to form even more hydronium ion. And so technically, you're going to add the hydronium ion formed from each of these steps. But that sounds really complicated. But what I wanted to tell you is that Ka2 is usually orders of magnitude smaller than Ka1, which means this second step doesn't really occur at all significantly. 
-hmm. So you can really just assume that only the first step, only loss of the first proton is significant and just treat it like a monoprotic acid set up an ice table. You're pretty safe doing that. So if you see that on the final, you can, for the most part, treat them as a monoproduct in a regular ice table. And the final thing I want to mention is if you have a polyprotic acid, so in this case I'm talking about oxalic acid, so it looks like this. Okay, if you have a polyprotic acid, the conjugate base of the original acid, so let's write out what that would be. If you put oxalic acid in water, its conjugate base would look like this. Okay. This conjugate base from a polyprotic acid is amphoteric. Do you remember what amphoteric meant? It means that something can act as both an acid as a base and a base. So let's look at that to prove it to ourselves. Um, here is the conjugate base of a polyprotic acid. And how is it acting in this reaction? It's acting as an acid, right? Because it just donated another proton to water. So that same conjugate base of oxalic acid can also act as a base. What does a base do? It abstracts a proton. So it could also reform the original oxalic acid if it acted as a base. And so you can see that conjugate base of polyprotic acids can act as both an acid or a base. So they are all amphoteric. So it's very common um, on actually on my test sometimes too for multiple choice and on the ACS final a multiple choice question that says which of the following could be amphoteric so we know that water can be um, but if you see the conjugate base of a polyprotic acid they can also be amphoteric that is it finally for titrations